On June 24th, 1497, Giovanni Caboto, or John Cabot if you're a true Englishman, would reach a fruitful end to his Atlantic voyage after docking his ship, the Matthew, in a bay on the east coast of what was called Terra Nova. This discovery is sometimes overshadowed by Columbus's own voyage, but I would argue that it's almost more important. Not only did it lead to the creation of the United States, Canada, and Newfoundland, but it also happened to find one of the most bountiful sources of fish in the entirety of North America, the Grand Banks. Upon returning to Bristol, John would tell the king, the fish were so thick it stayed the course of our ship. You could practically walk on the backs of cod and not sink. You could dip a bucket into the ocean and it would be filled to the brim with cod. That statement was as unbelievable to the English king as it was to anyone born after 1992. But Johnny wasn't lying. Let's dive into the rise and fall of the cod, the white-fleshed gold that built and destroyed Newfoundland and almost started a war between Canada and Spain. This is a new song. We've never played this song before. We've never practiced it or anything. Because the name of the band's called Cod, because we're concerned about fish and fisheries and this kind of thing. So this song is about this, this situation, all right? Okay, this is called for Cod and Country. So stand up. So stand up. Off the coast of old Newfoundland lie the Grand Banks. And there there is a mighty fishery for which we give our thanks to cod and sprod to which we owe our life and to our many of Newfoundland has a long and rich history, so pardon me if I skip past the next roughly half millennia. For roughly 500 years, families in Newfoundland fished the cod, and the cod was good for them. Salted, smoked, boiled, baked, battered, fried, grilled, or raw, fishing was life on the rock. And as the 1980s turned into the 1990s, seemingly nothing was going to change. As with any other place in the Western world, Newfoundland started to mechanize, and soon the small fishing boats gave way to trawlers and draggers. They were large ships that could cast their wide nets and haul in huge quantities of bottom-feeding fish like cod and turbot. It made life immeasurably easier for the fishermen and guaranteed that the captains would make their money's worth in a shorter amount of time. Traditional methods of harvesting that were still being practiced in places Places like the North Shore and Labrador couldn't compete with the trawlers outside of local economies. Fishermen would come from far and wide to drag the Grand Bank, mostly from Iberian countries, Spain or Portugal. In the 60s and 70s, there were so many Portuguese fishermen in Newfoundland that the Premier John Smallwood declared June 10th Portugal Day. And rightly so, because after the Vikings, but before the English, João Corte Real had found Terra do Bacalao, or Land of the Cod, in 1463, which turned out to also be Newfoundland. 
The Portuguese and Spanish would ride into St. John's Harbor in boats painted white, affectionately called the White Fleet, to rest and relax before making their trip home. The Newfoundlanders and Iberians may not have spoken each other's language, but they did have a shared mutual understanding of the sea and the cod, which made them perfect bedfellows for almost 500 years. When biologists started noticing an alarming drop in cod numbers in 1986, traditions started meaning less and less to the provincial government. The drop in cod numbers was, frankly, shocking. Industrialized fishing in the Grand Banks had decimated the population. At the rate they were pulling from the sea, the Newfoundlanders would have no more cod to harvest in as little as a decade. Thankfully, for the cod, in 1986, Spain and Portugal joined the EU. This reduced the catch quotas of the two countries and helped the problem in the short term. Unfortunately, it didn't do enough to stave off complete ecosystem collapse. By 1992, the writing was on the wall for Newfoundland fishing. Something had to be done immediately. But who was going to step in and tell families who had been fishing the Grand Bank for close to five centuries that they could no longer ply their trade? A celebration was also planned for a small Newfoundland community today, but the party turned into a protest. As we reported last night, Ottawa is about to announce a moratorium on northern cod, a fishing ban that will cost 20,000 jobs. Understandably, people are anxious for more details, but today Fisheries Minister John Crosby refused to reveal them. And that brought a hostile welcome for the guest of honour. This is going to affect everybody, from truck drivers to grocery stores to everything. There's a lot of people's homes are going to be gone, cars gone. The dish is going back to their soup kitchen days. I didn't take the fish from the goddamn water. Who took you and your goddamn people? Enter John Crosby, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans for the Mulroney government. A government that was already massively unpopular across the country thanks to a new tax, the GST. When the new quotas were announced, a reaction was anticipated, but not on the level that materialized. Crosby couldn't go anywhere without being harassed, and the Newfoundland economy would take a beating. Roughly 40,000 Newfoundlanders would be put out of work overnight, approximately 7% of the working population. The federal government provided income assistance to those affected, but nothing could replace cod profits. Crosby, did you expect this kind of reaction when you brought this announcement down? They don't need to go berserk, trying to batter on doors to frighten me. A year later in 1993, the flight out west began. The Alberta oil boom was hiring anyone who could stand the working conditions, and many former cod fishermen switched trades. When I was a kid, Fort McMurray in northern Alberta was chock full of Newfoundlanders who would eventually bring their families and settle in the province permanently. Originally, the cod fishing ban was only supposed to last until 1994, but by 1995, the numbers weren't bouncing back. They were only getting worse. Brian Tobin was now the Minister for Fisheries and Oceans after Jean Chrétien's win over Kim Campbell's Conservatives. He desperately tried to blame the destruction of the Grand Bank cod to anything but the fishermen. In 1995, he opened up the harp seal hunt again, stoking ire from Greenpeace and other environmental groups. No matter how many seals were caught, the cod numbers didn't improve. And then, to add insult to injury, a Spanish fishing vessel would also be caught dragging the Grand Banks. Cod wasn't the only fish in the Grand Bank. Turbot, or by another name, Greenland halibut, was another fish that sold well in Canada thanks in part to its price and the quality of its meat. It wasn't cod, but in a time when cod was off limits, the turbot was a glass of water in the desert. By 1994, turbot was also under threat of being overfished by Newfoundlanders, the Spanish, and Portuguese. Tobin, wanting to avoid the fate of Crosby, contacted the EU Fishing Council and asked them to confirm that their trawlers weren't fishing in Canada's exclusion zone. There was no response. In March of 1995, the EU increased their turbot quotas, a move that was in direct defiance of what Canada had requested. In response, the Chrétien government extended the exclusive fishing zone to encompass the entire Grand Bank, and Tobin didn't mince words. If an EU fishing vessel was caught in Canada's protected zone, they would respond with aggressive action. A Canadian patrol plane spotted the Spanish trawler Estai fishing off the Grand Bank area. Whether or not this was in international waters or the Canadian zone is debated by either side, but regardless, when the Estai spotted the plane, they cut their nets and turned back to Spain. 
They were immediately chased by three armed patrol boats from the Canadian Coast Guard and Department of Fisheries. As the Coast Guard approached cannon range, they demanded the Estai stop. When no response was recorded, one of the patrol boats opened fire with three or four 50 cal shots and raked the side of the Estai, which caused her to stop dead in the water. The other Spanish vessels in the area attempted to moor alongside the Estai and save the crew, but they too were stopped by water cannons from the other Canadian ships. The Estai and her crew were paraded into St. John's Harbor to cheers. Two days later, Spain caught wind of the seizure and sent out its own patrol boats to counter any Canadian naval action. This was the closest Canada had come to war with Europe since 1945, and Tobin wasn't backing down. The Estai's net had been found, and upon inspection it was deemed illegal due to the size of the mesh. Tobin went on a smear campaign to New York, parading the net and showing the international community what the Spanish and Portuguese were doing to delay Canada's efforts to return the Grand Bank to its former glory. The Estai and her crew were eventually released and sent back to Spain, and in turn the Spanish enacted harsh visa requirements for any Canadian in the country, forcing them back to Canada. The EU's fishery commissioner also wasn't budging on her position. She labelled the Canadian action as piracy, and said the EU vessels were free to do as they want in what she considered international waters. On March 25th, another Spanish ship, the Pescamero Uno, would be caught and its nets cut. Spain again responded with a patrol boat escort. When asked what to do if Spain showed force, Prime Minister Jean Chrétien told the Canadian Navy to fire on any vessel displaying their cannons. Thankfully, the Canadians weren't alone. The Irish and the United Kingdom showed solidarity with the Canadian side and began flying Canadian flags on their ships. This unfortunately led to an incident where the British fishing boat Newland was arrested by the French Navy in a case of mistaken identity. The British were so incensed that the French would detain their boats that soon after, most mariners of the British Isles were all flying Canadian flags. The escalation was getting too ridiculous for both sides. Were two NATO nations really going to go to war over a fish? The game had to end, and both sides thankfully decided to pull their punches. On April 17, 1995, Spain and the EU officially recognized Canada's ownership of the Grand Banks, and recognized their rights to use military force to remove foreign fishing vessels from their exclusion zone. Canada, in turn, would reduce their fishing quotas for turbot and cod even further, and refunded the $500,000 bail that the Estai paid to get its ship back. Tobin went from just another minister to a celebrity overnight in Newfoundland. Affectionately called the Turbotinator, or Captain Canada, he would run for premier in Newfoundland and win in 1996. In 1997, the cod ban was lifted, but the quotas were significantly reduced. The cod was placed on the endangered species list in 2000, and as of 2020, still haven't recovered. Complications from global warming and the abundance of illegal fishing is still blamed for the lack of growth. The quota was again reduced in 2018, but only time will tell if that makes a difference. The population of Newfoundland and their economy still haven't recovered to pre-cod ban levels. In 1997, the Hebron oil fields were explored, and as of 2022, they are still going strong, employing many of the displaced oil workers that cut their teeth on Alberta's tar sands. To celebrate the 500th year of John Cabot's voyage, in 1997 a shipmaker in Bristol created a replica of the Matthew and sailed it into St. John's Harbour. While it was welcomed with celebration, this time there was unfortunately no cod to stay the progress of the ship, nor to walk on the backs of. Thanks for watching.